Wow. Hey, what is with these head things? A Moor came here a long time ago and seduced a local girl. But then she found out that he had a wife and children back home. So she cut his head off. Oh, Jesus. After a first season that was a bit overhyped but solid, and meant as a limited series, mind you, along comes a second season. How will this one fare? Will it also be solid? And will they repeat the tease with a murder in a flash forward gimmick from the first entry? Hi there, it's Micha. Join me for this review if you like to find out. Like in the freshman year of this anthology series, the sophomore season covers the one week stay of a group of guests in the White Lotus, which turns out to be a chain of resorts, with this one being located in Sicily. There we have three generations of men from the Di Grasso family, who made the trip to research their roots, as the Di Grassos originated from Sicily. While Grandpa is quite intrusively flirting with young women, his Can I show you how to close the curtains? There's a button over there. That's okay, we'll figure it out. I'd like to know, where is this button, Isabella? Dad, his son inherited his demeanor towards the fairer sex, which currently landed him in the doghouse after stepping out on his wife, and not for the first time. Grandson Albie, however, is a nice guy and feminist. Next, we have two young couples where the guys were college roommates. Both are rich, but one of them just came recently into money and is now significantly better off than his friend. Also, Greg and Tanya, Jennifer Coolidge's character from season one, return, now married to each other, which, by the way, in my book, makes this only a semi-anthology series. What the hell is she doing here? Why? Tanya also brought her assistant Portia along. I'm traveling by myself. You bring your assistant to a vacation with your husband. Get rid of her. All right, I'll get rid of her. I'll get rid of her, all right? You're gonna have to get lost. Okay. I see you in a week then? No, 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 no. I, I want you to stay, stay close, because I might need you. But just lay low and not come out of your room. A young woman she doesn't really treat well due to her own neediness. While Portia and Albie, the youngest of the Di Grasso family, seem to hit it off, there is also another young man that catches her attention. The rest of the cast is made up by locals, mainly by Valentina, the strict resort manager, and by a young sex worker who was hired by Albie's father, go figure, and her best friend, an aspiring singer. During the week, they all learn important truths about themselves that will change their lives forever, for better or worse. While the freshman season was all about power dynamics, the sophomore entry focuses on sex, faithfulness, trust and forgiveness within relationships, which is present in basically every character's story arc, and most of those plot lines were very well executed. However, I hoped they wouldn't pull the same flash forward stunt again, but this season actually doubled down on it, by once more starting at the end of a week with a body floating in the water. What the fuck is that? Oh my God. And several others discovered nearby, before returning to one week earlier. <sighs> At least this time around I knew that this is a little bit of a misdirect, as this is not a murder mystery but a drama series with a little bit of dark humor sprinkled in. Though I felt the humor was less prominent than in the previous season, and actually it had some mystery elements on board. However, that mystery's outcome unfortunately became blatantly obvious quite early on, and along the way was so many times hinted at that it almost felt like an insult towards us, the viewer, and for sure as an insult towards the players involved. It also didn't help that they brought back Jennifer Coolidge's character, which for me was the most annoying character in season one. Don't get me wrong, the role was supposed to be annoying and Jennifer is a great actor who brilliantly achieved that goal. However, that didn't change the fact that I didn't need that character to return for another round, especially as there seems to have been no character development between seasons. The overall writing and production value was strong again, as was the acting. What surprised me was the different setting. Originally conceived as a limited series, the first season ended with the staff waving at the next group of guests arriving, so I expected they would continue there. 
I guess the idea of bringing Tanya back informed the change of scenery, as they didn't want her to return to Hawaii once more. However, this new location came at a price, introducing Italian stereotypes. Sorry to say that, but there was some really lazy character creation at hand. All the local men are oversexed and horny, of course especially when encountering American beauties, sometimes even giving off a rapey vibe. Lots of horny dudes in that, though. While the women are either literal prostitutes or willing to trade sex to advance their careers, uptight closeted lesbians or, and I quote, a bunch of banshees. No, no, we come in peace. No, no, we're related. We're related. We should go. I had a dream that we went to visit our relatives. They turned out to be a bunch of banshees and chased us out of town. They also wrote hard on the cliché of women only being interested in tough guys. Real men that will treat them badly while nice guys always finish last. Something that unfortunately often turns out to be true in real life. I have to give them that. And with that being said, let's get to the rating. Though most critics praised this season as an improvement over the first, for me it fell short of it. With them pulling the same misdirect at the start, the return of an annoying character, an utterly predictable and borderline insulting plotline and positively insulting stereotypes, this season could not measure up. Some of the other characters were also not as interesting as in season 1, even though the acting was on par. The standout performance for me was Aubrey Plaza in the role of the new rich guy's wife, but even that couldn't raise the overall impression to more than a solid average. Therefore I'm rating this season with 5 out of 10 points, which means it is still worth a watch, it just wasn't a brilliant experience for me. However, as I know that Jennifer Coolidge's character was a fan favorite for many people, they will likely enjoy this season more. So if you are one of them, keep that in mind and add a point or two. What about you? Did you like Jennifer Coolidge's character in season 1 and even in season 2? Did you also feel that that one plotline was totally predictable? Whatever you like to share, let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, feel free to like, share or subscribe. So much for now, see you next time and thanks for watching. There we have three generation of men from the DeGrasso family who made the trio trip to <laughs> a young woman she doesn't really treat well due to her... <clears throat> and most of those plot lines were very well executed. Blah, blah, blah.